There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Your Mountain Podcast. I am your host, David Wilms, and we are on a new location. Should we call this Studio 1B? Uh, I, sure. I don't know. Studio 2. This is pretty comfortable. It's, it's what we go NC. for here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really like, it's just a happy place. You're spoiling us here, Nephi. We're going to start, we we start doing this here we more We got often. the fire going. We're watching Star Wars. Laying, yeah, hanging around on, on like a leather couch. Yeah, with mm. cup holders everywhere. It's like I'm in a minivan, but cooler. That's the, that's the feel I was going for. <laughs> minivan. Yeah, much better than my place. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it. <laughs> no, this is, this is good. Uh, Who doesn't like minivans? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to raise my hand at that. I don't like them either. I, I, that's, that was a, I guess that was a... Look, I don't want to offend anybody. If any anybody. of you out there raised your hands, I, I don't want to offend you. anybody that drives a minivan because I've been known to rent those. Mm-hmm. And I know. I, I feel like I get into those and I just feel this awful is worth about talking myself. about. This is worth taking a moment to speak about. It's like when you go on a trip, your strategy for being a cheapskate when going on a trip. Oh, yeah, yeah. So most people would drive their own cars, right? Yeah, because you bought a car so you could drive it and you liked it, right? right. It makes perfect sense. But I, want I have, did. But I want to have that car forever. Because I don't want to have to buy another one. Yes. So instead of driving my car, <laughs> I rent a car if it's, <laughs> if it's over about a 200-mile trip. Uh, figuring yeah. at about you know, the federal reimbursement rate of 59.5 cents a mile, you factor that out. It's just a lot cheaper to rent a car and pay the gas on that and put the depreciation on that rather than my own vehicle. You can't drive anywhere in Wyoming under 200 miles. Right. I've got a lot of frequent points <laughs> or travel points with some rental companies. Uh, plus, yeah. you know, then I don't actually have to buy a minivan, but I can rent one guilt-free. And I get into it, and I feel I, I feel so guilty and awful because I, I generally hate minivans. And I get up, I get in them, and I'm like, why in minivans. the world is this so How could practical hate and this? comfortable? They're, yeah, they're, they're like cargo pants. I know. But I don't rent cargo pants. <laughs> I know. Uh, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna run them, just run them. Uh, just own it. Man, we could we could spend thirty minutes talking. You know what about the problem those. is? They don't make a minivan with a big enough trunk for you with a big enough bed. If they look, did, look if, if you would a, own one. If there's a minivan with a with a like a bed, yeah, and, you would have it and lifted with big tires. Now and come on, four wheel drive. Does your truck you, have a lift? No, you just have to take no. the seats out. You can fit a four by eight sheet of plywood. Yeah, in a so minivan, you, which means you can fit an elk in there. Absolutely. Yeah, it just doesn't have the clearance Sleep I need it. to yeah. get. I mean, that's the issue. Just you know what I'm going to do? This is going to be one of our first. How many giveaways that we had on this show? We're going to give away a minivan. We're going to give away <laughs> a federal premium ammunition belt buckle to the first one of our listeners who sends us a picture of them hunting in their minivan. All right, Ooh, deal. I like it. Deal. I like that. Let, how let, how let, are they going to? This will be put it on Facebook. We're just going to see. We're going to put it on Facebook with the All first right. one that Instagram. sends us. Yeah. So, so somebody post it to one of our uh, social sites. Post to one of our social sites. We're just going to go by the by when it gets here. The first person to post a picture of you hunting in a minivan, you are going to get uh, and and hunting we using and a minivan we get to share it from a minivan. Yes, you can't. <laughs> just so we're clear, we don't want any illegalities in the picture. We want you to be totally on the up and up. There you go. I, All right, I, I like it. So, so if you're going to do that, remember our handle out there is at it's your mountain. At It's Your Mountain, and you can find us on you know all the social media platforms. If you want to email it to us, you can email it to us at yourmountain at itsyourmountain.com. Uh, that's, that sounds pretty fun. Do you we, think if you're hunting in another state that, that renting a minivan from Avis would be a good call? I, I mean, I didn't just say Avis, did I? That's not who I use. That's not who I use either. That's why I <laughs> bring them up. Uh, anyway, we've spent enough time on minivans. Uh, let's get to the real point of why we're here. Uh, we are joined tonight by Jessica Crowder. Um, first of all, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for um, inviting me. This is great. Are you sure about that? I, well. <laughs> <laughs> Jury's out. No, yeah, yeah. Give me about 30 minutes and I'll let you know. <laughs> 
You didn't know you were getting into a, you know, a minivan, minivan conversation. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, us either, actually. Uh, so Jessica, you're, you are with the Western Landowners Alliance. That's right. Yeah. Uh, tell it, break it down for us. Tell us, first of all, for those that aren't familiar, what is the Western Landowner Alliance? Sure. Um, so I'm the policy director for an organization called the Western Landowners Alliance. And uh, the Western Landowners Alliance, in simplest terms, is a landowner-led organization that basically works to find solutions for landowners so that they can take good care of their land um, and put conservation on the ground and conservation practices. And also, um, m many of our members also have uh, agricultural operations. So, you know, focusing on that sustainability and uh, viability of uh, agricultural operations as well as certainly uh, connected landscapes and working lands. And then a real focus on conservation of s native species as well. So I want to uh, let me dive into that a little bit. So when you uh, just the conservation piece, sure. Let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a just the small you, piece. Yeah. Well, yeah, you just yeah. you just gave a mouthful. <laughs> I don't know exactly where the best place is to start. So let's start at the back of this, the the conservation piece. So you know, what kind of you know, what kind of things are you looking at? What what's important to landowners from a you know, the standpoint of conservation? That's a great question. So as, as you all know, every landowner is different. Um, and certainly our members are very different. Some are small landowners, some are large landowners. Um, all of them have different uh, economic situations. They have different backgrounds, different expertise, different family situations. Um, and of course, they all live on different landscapes. So they have uh, different soils, grasses, wildlife, habitat. Um, and, and so that uh, becomes a really interesting conversation on what does it really take to, you know, create solutions for landowners and focus on solutions for landowners so that they can uh, really focus on conservation if they're interested in doing so. And so what we look at are things um, such as the Endangered Species Act or the Farm Bill. Um, kind of Those are kind of big picture items um, and really focus on, um, you know, how... What is it? How does it? What does it really take um, for a landowner to to be able to, no matter what their situation is, what does it take for them to be able to create wildlife habitat or improve wildlife habitat or even sustain wildlife habitat on their private lands? Um, with the idea that certainly um, private landowners that are interested in that conservation piece provide benefit to all of us. Um, and of course, that's pretty that's pretty variable depending on what type of situation a particular landowner is in on what will work best. Um, so we kind of try to look at the big picture and make sure that all the tools are in the toolbox for those landowners. Yeah, that's really interesting because I mean, th to me that that means like you really do have to have a bunch of different tools in that toolbox. A whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's. I mean, that's exciting that you have that opportunity. I've always believed that the best way to work on conservation issues is to do that. It's basically just have a large box and then to let people in, you know, give them some, some things to work with, but allow them to innovate within that box to find out what works for each individual. Because, you know, my background working with the NRCS was that, you know, you're never going to find a landowner where, you know, there isn't a one size fits all. There's a reason there's hundreds of, of uh, different conservation practices because you know, 10 of them might work on one place. Right. You know, it's not going to be 200 and, 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 and you can't work with just one. Right, right. And there's a few, I would say there's there's really kind of three buckets that we work in. Um, you know, the first is kind of that policy side, which I, I work on, which is trying to find those tools and, and make sure that they're in the toolbox. Um, but we also do peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing, um, and we spend quite a bit of time on that. So uh, a lot of landowners kind of like to know you know, what works for my neighbor? Um, and, and is that something that would work for me? And that peer-to-peer -peer knowledge is really important. And then we also um, tell the story, the stewardship story and the conservation story to others. And we do that through short films and um, other ways as well. And, and so I think that all of that kind of adds to the conversation about um, what we what we do and and what our members are working towards. Well, so you you bring up a point I'd like you to address a little bit because I think in, for some people uh, there's a stigma uh, around, for example, public land grazing, right? There's there's this presumption that landowners are you know, 
turning their livestock out and you know on their own land and on public land grazing it until you know just trying to get the ma- maximize the profit out of it grazing it till there's nothing left mm-hmm. right and you know, we around this table know that's not true um, but i'd like to hear your take on on that because it's you know there are organizations out there and you're probably dealing with them on a daily basis whose principal objective is to remove landowners from public lands right you know retire grazing allotments right reduce AUMs all of that how do you how do you address those concerns organizationally so we have members um certainly that operate on public lands as well as their private lands. And and so I think that it's really important, um, you know, first of all, part of our mission is sustaining working lands and connected landscapes. And those public lands are part of those landscapes. And so I think it's really important to remember that um, as you look across the landscape, it's not just to this land ownership boundary, in, you know, we manage one way and then it, when we step onto somebody else's property, the public's property in this scenario, we manage differently. I think that, um, you know, most landowners, as you said, um, and and most uh, producers have a love of the land and they want to be good stewards of the land and they want to take care of the land for the benefit of er everyone. Um, You know, in the end, certainly they have to also operate a business and you you can't do that um, if you can't make money obviously it's like any business but part of that investment in the business of course is taking care of the places that you depend upon and that's that's really important for our members and and i would say most landowners and land managers out there um it's an investment to take care of land whether it's yours or whether it's public land and um so we kind of approach it from that standpoint of of you know it, it it is important and and the other piece that i would say um, is important is landowners and land managers need the flexibility across landscapes to manage appropriately. So they need the opportunity to be able to make adjustments um, to improve their management schemes uh, so that it does actually benefit the soil and water habitat for uh, native species as well as their operation. So more of an adaptive management. Uh, you, you find that you're working on the public land that is that more ob- obviously on private land. They can adapt on the fly. They can do what they need to do, uh, right? Right. What's the experience on, on public land? You know. Well, s- certainly there are barriers. <laughs> um, I <laughs> well, think. Like what? Like what? <laughs> we could talk about. Well, um, yeah. even just the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, that process takes time. Um, so, if a landowner has a really good idea for how to, you know, manage public lands a little bit better and more in, in concert with the landscape, those processes do take time. Um, of course, we you know we support those processes. We think NEPA is important. It's an important um, tool for the agencies for decision making. It's also important for public I- input into how public lands are managed. But um, you know, having some thought around what adaptive management looks like, or um, even thinking about the recent outcome-based grazing pilot projects that the BLM is currently working on. All of those things um, are kind of innovative ideas of how how can we be a little bit more nimble. And, and if, an, if a landowner comes forward and has an idea of how to put a practice on the ground that might benefit uh, the public lands, a, a little bit of opportunity and being more nimble to actually make that happen is pretty important. So... so. This is actually a great teachable moment, I think. So first I want to, you know, back up to something that's, that's I think is super interesting, which is, you know, you talked about uh, this uh, this concert, if you will, between private lands and public lands in the West. I don't think a lot of people maybe don't recognize, but, you know, if you go east, you know, you have agricultural operations that are built around 100 acres. You know, I think as you move west, for example, Wyoming has the largest average farm size or ranch size in the United States of America. And that's because, you know, when you change from areas that get a lot of precipitation, a lot of rain, a lot of growth to the arid west, it just takes a whole lot longer to grow anything. And sometimes you can't grow, for example, crops in a lot of these areas. What you can grow, or I used to say, you know, it'd be super cool. You look out across the desert here. Wouldn't it be great if you had some kind of a machine that could go around here 
and like pick up little blades of grass and turn them into hamburgers. Yeah, and you do. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly what, you know, that's what cattle grazing does. But a lot of people don't realize, I think when they, you know, we have a, we all have a share, have a mutual friend who's a great example of this, who, uh, you know, you have these ranches that are a hundred plus years old that are, were built on, you know, uh, you know, these lower areas that where they can hay and they can, they can put up hay during the summer. But in order to do that, they, the, those, that time period for those that don't know, like those cattle go someplace else. So you have a relatively small winter area, you know, a thousand acres or something like that. But then these grazing leases that are sometimes contiguous with these, with these smaller ranches are absolutely integral to the whole survival of the ranch. So for people that think, well, why would you, you know, you could just quit grazing on public lands. The reality is if you didn't have, you know, that adjacent grazing lease, if that lease was gone, some of those operations just becomes infeasible to remain in agriculture anymore. And then that's when these places become, you know, a trophy ranch. That's when they become a subdivision because those, those open spaces and open places now are no longer, it's no longer viable to have those as, open spaces year round because the operation, the economics just no longer work. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's that whole idea of a connected landscape. And I would add on to that. And and now I think Nephi and I are kind of getting into range nerd territory. Yeah, we got to be careful. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> that's okay. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back into policy wonk we'll, territory. We'll, we'll pull you out of the trenches if we, we have If we to. get too far. Yeah. Um, but I or, think... Or the, pull you out of the weeds. I mean, something is that, like is that, that. what yeah. we should yeah. say instead? Yeah. Pull you out of the weeds? So for I people that so. don't know, I, my, my background, I'm a, a soil scientist. You say it every other episode. Yeah. I don't think but, I do. <laughs> but my background, I'm, I have, um, my background is in range management. I know you so guys. So we you're welcome. No, down, you're welcome. I know for your soils are feeding. Mike and I will just sit grass. over here for the next thirty minutes and listen to you, you guys. Just dream about yeah, law. Yeah, just, we're going to talk about how grass grows for a while. Yeah, Jessica is <laughs> the only person I know that has framed weeds in her office. That's a good. That's true. That is true. Are they're they not noxious? Weeds, though. No, it's no, the state flower and the state grass of Wyoming. Oh, yeah. 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 For those Come people on. that don't know, well now, okay, now you've now, teed uh, it now up. Now I look like a jerk. <laughs> now, you've teed it, now you've teed it up. So we know that the state flower of Wyoming is the Indian, Indian paintbrush. Paint brush. What is the state grass? Western wheat grass. Western wheat grass. Well, what's the okay. state weed? I don't know. That probably grass. in Cheat my grass. backyard it's Dalmatian toad flax, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, the state soil is forkwood. I know you were dying to know no. that. There's yeah. a state soil. Yeah. Doesn't our legislature have anything it's better us the cap to do? Wow. Oh, man. That takes me back. So, so, he was so a, he, anyway. Before it was a joke about how wonky you guys were. Now it's proven. Yeah, I think it we've is, settled that. It? I think yeah. we have. So anyway, my point was going to be simply that um, not in every case, but in many cases, livestock are good for the land, too. Um, and so, you know, s- certainly there are scenarios where if you can utilize livestock to create habitat or to, um, you know, use their hooves to get seeds in the ground and things like that. I, I mean, that's a benefit to public lands as yeah, well. I, I or think fine fuel management. I, there's all kinds in, of scenarios. Intuitively, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't get that. That doesn't make any sense to me because, you know, livestock, you know, isn't that a new thing, a European thing? But the reality is these American landscapes, you know, these open prairies have always had huge herds of undulates on them. True. It's just that right now our huge herds of undulates, undulates look a little bit different. All right, so... You guys introduced a lot of things that maybe your average listener doesn't quite get. And by average listener, I wrote that you down mean too. Mike like and I, I sitting over yeah, here. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> so you, you say large size ungulates. Yeah. Um, you're talking about buffalo or other beasts. Bi- bison. Bison. Yeah, yeah, bison. Thank you, Dave, for you the bet. correction. Bison. And and I call them buffalo. And so, uh, but Jessica, also you mentioned that there were different ways in which they operate to create habitat and do things i mean how does a cow other than um cow flatulence being a problem for climate change how are they beneficial that's to, debatable yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah well yeah. you should have seen him wink when he said that <laughs> yeah. so, uh, no but i mean i mean explain to the average person how how a cow can be beneficial to the habitat on the public land yeah, I well, there's all kinds of ways, so I won't dig too deep into sure. the details. But um, you know, l- livestock are a tool and could can be a tool. So uh, they can be used to manage weeds. Um, you know, uh, they might eat weeds, and therefore that's a good thing. Um, they can be used to control fine fuel. So in other words, 
they eat grass and f- so, flowers. So fine fuel would be grass and flowers. Well, can I can I get yeah. even more specific? Small stuff, and so then you don't have as much. You know, you might not have as much fuel for a fire. Yeah, you can uh, get more specific. Uh, Go so for it. So just to give a an example that might resonate, right? So mentioned cheatgrass potentially being the state noxious weed of Idaho, wa- of Idaho, Wyoming, <laughs> the, the West, right? Nevada, the Idaho um, state grass. You, Sorry, Idaho. So, s- and you know this stuff better than I do, but cheatgrass is an early emerger, right? It's one of the first grasses to come up. It is. Uh, and it loses its nutritional value once once se- the seed heads form. Yeah. Uh, but also it dries out quickly, outcompetes everything, and then it becomes a, an easy fuel source to burn large areas of sagebrush, which are critical habitat. And I'm not using the term critical habitat in the ESA context. I'm using it in the you know, endangered species context. I'm using it just as it's important habitat yeah. for things like sage grouse and mule deer and, uh, and you know pygmy rabbits and a whole host right. of other species that live in the sagebrush ecosystem. And so what you're saying is if you hit it hard early in the season, maybe you're not saying, I'm saying this, if you hit it hard, public lands hard early in the season as this cheatgrass is emerging, you can you can then knock it back, allow native grasses to come up. Those grasses that, that, that germinate later. That germinate later yep. and are you know typical in, you know typical natives. grasses natives in that sagebrush um, environment, and you reduce the risk of fire. Right. And at the same time, combat it, a noxious weed. More or less. Now, cheatgrass is really interesting, and I won't get too far in the weeds on this one either, but uh, oh, I know, it's, right? It's, it's just like too easy to keep saying it. Again, I know. Yeah. Thanks for getting that stuck in my head. You bet. Um, so so I'll cheatgrass. Try and, I'll try and root it. Okay. You know, pull that, pull <laughs> I'll root it. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so cheatgrass germinates in the fall, and what's interesting is that if you have the flexibility to manage it, you can, you know, look at the you know, the reaction basically of the cheatgrass to hard grazing, heavy grazing in the spring. And if that's, you know, maybe not working, there's some recent research that's starting to show that maybe that fall grazing when it germinates and it's nutritious is also a good time to kind of hit it. Um, and, and it's a, you know, again, it's a whole idea of flexibility to be able to actually use livestock as a tool. Okay. So one tool is cows eat. That's right. Okay. Yeah. What else? So also related to that, um, I, you know, elk tend to kind of like, for example, kind of fresh, nutritious grass. And if you are thinking about your management, you can put uh, cattle or, you know, livestock out on an area that elk like to use. And they can graze off kind of the dead stuff. And then it produces highly nutritious, palatable grass happy grasses that elk can come later on and munch on. And the livestock yep. doesn't eat that grass or they're you off. Just by them. They're off. You just have to manage lease. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. that that's, so there's lots of scenarios. That's an important point that, you know, you need to come back to that. I think again, a point that's missed by a lot of people about, you know, grazing management is that ranchers are managing this stuff. They're out there looking at this. They're moving these herds around. So people, there's a, this common misconception out there, I think, among those who don't know, they just kind of like grazing on public lands means you just scatter cattle to the wind mm-hmm. and hope that they come home someday. And that's just not the case. I mean, this is, this is it's timed, it's planned, it's watched. It's managed and yes. it's monitored. Can we do the legal nerd out for a second? Do it. You know why that is? I do know, Dave, but I don't know the legal why. Taylor Grazing Act. Yeah. Right. Taylor Grazing Act. What was that? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out here, and then somebody's gonna correct me because I'll be wrong about the date. But I think it was around 1934. That's right. Right? Did I get it the right date? You did. Yeah. Oh man, I don't even have any notes. I want everybody to admit that I don't have any notes. Uh, <laughs> no, you've got a giant <laughs> trapper <laughs> keeper <laughs> sitting in front of you. You know what? I'm I actually not participating in that. I actually do have a trapper keeper. <laughs> I'll bring it next time. <laughs> I am. You saved I that. am going to bring it. I have a. T- I have a trapper keeper from when I was in second grade. Yeah, it's got you as pass mini- it down to your kids. It's got, <laughs> as, it's got as minivan receipts in it. I actually tried to pass it down. There are a lot of things I've tried to pass down to my kids that they turns out they don't want. Um, <laughs> I thought, well, one, I thought my trapper keeper would be something that absolutely want. Turns mm-hmm. out I was wrong. I had an MC Hammer <laughs> spiral notebook that still had oh pages in it that I just dug out of a box not long ago. I mean, he's wearing the parachute pants and dancing across the... <laughs> Kids, kids didn't want that either. I was just blown away, yeah. absolutely blown away. Yeah. Kids Spoiled. these days, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> they're huh. they're not into MC Hammer and Trapper Keepers, but they love my old slap bracelets. 
Oh, well, yeah, who doesn't like those? Well, right? <laughs> yeah, but they, I mean, those are used today. I know, but back then when they first made them, um, it's not like a lot of them are recalled it's not like because VHS. they cut people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Oh, I do. Have, have I showed you the picture? This is a huge tent. Have I showed you the picture of my daughter playing our original Nintendo in, in NES on a cathode ray TV yeah, you have. with a VCR on the top of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not like you had to dig that stuff out of storage. That was just in no, use in your basement. it's set up in my basement. Wow. Yeah. That's our entertainment center for the kids. Yeah. It's impressive. That's like fun. the way that going to the museum is impressive. Anyway, back to the Taylor <laughs> Grazing Act. <laughs> back to the Taylor Grazing Act. So the idea behind the Taylor Grazing Act, 1934, was at that time you actually did have uh, landowners that, that there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a ton of management going on back then because we didn't really understand the systems the way we do today. And we were starting to gain some knowledge and recognize that, you know what, you know, we need to start managing these lands. You know, you had the Dust Bowl come around. You had a lot of uh, degradation of the resource, and we needed to figure out a system. And so the Taylor Grazing Act is what created these grazing districts and a permit system uh, and, and became the basis for how um, how allottees get their permits and, yeah, and start grazing. And then it's built over time, and all the science has developed, and it's become this, you know, this really, really sophisticated uh, management regi- regime. But it all started... In 1934. It's kind of funny, but we as a nation have kind of figured that out, right? And and we're not great at it, but we're getting better and better, which is this concept of, you know what, these things we put on the landscape, maybe it's a good idea to manage them rather than just letting, you know, letting everything go and do whatever it wants to do, wherever it wants to. And it's, and it's something, it's a, it's common theme for how we manage, it's, it's wildlife, it's livestock, it's forest resources, it's, uh, it's waterways. It's, you know, we've, re- I mean, it, it's the reality is I think that, uh, I think it's a very positive thing to approach it and say like, you know what, we we're here, we're part of this system. We have a responsibility for, it. we need to manage it. We need to conserve it if we want it to be something that isn't just accidentally lost in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, well, and I think the word stewardship really resonates. And, and I think, I mean, we're changing. We learn more all the time, as you both said, um, we're changing. I think I said it first, Dave. Yeah. That's on, um, you, you can have credit for it. I'm just, I don't care. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get in the middle of this. No, no. <laughs> no I'm kidding. It's so, um, but I, but I think that that's, we that's, just all, let's just agree that we all agree. We do this. all agree. I and, agree with and you, And I think that's, that's a really important <laughs> point that as we learn more, you know, we just, we just get better at figuring out you know, what uses belong where and what it looks like and what management looks like. But I I think, you know, kind of getting back to Western Landowners Alliance at the root of what our members and our our organization are interested in is we want to do what's best for the land because that's the foundation of um, everything, really. It's the foundation of our economies. It's the foundation of our members' livelihoods um, and and landowners, you know, everywhere's livelihood. It's the foundation of wildlife, um, conservation and habitat and fisheries and clean water. And I, I mean, so, so really, if you can kind of just boil it down to that piece of stewarding the land and taking care of it and doing what's right for the land, um, you're creating a foundation for the future, and y- that's important. So you know, how we important is wildlife? For your members, very. You, you mentioned wildlife, and I'm just. Yeah. We talk a lot about it on this podcast, obviously, and I'm sure. Kind of curious how our how mem- important it is. To yeah, it. very. Our our membership is, um, w- well, our mission, you know, um, is c- sustaining connected landscapes, working lands, and native species. Um, and of course, native species can encompass plants as well. But uh, it, wildlife and fisheries are incredibly important for our members. Um, in fact, one of the things that, you know, we talk about that peer to peer network and knowledge sharing. Um, one of the things that the Western Landowners Alliance does well, um, and, and that was really interesting to me when I started with them, is, is that peer to peer knowledge and that real interest that our members have in providing for wildlife and fishery habitat. And, um, really finding those opportunities for conservation and, and sharing what they've learned about that and kind of having, you know, a support system and a, and a knowledge sharing system around that topic. So do you partner with other organizations on you know, wildlife related projects or fisheries? Um, we do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What we kind do. of, what kind of partnerships? I mean, you don't have to name names. Just not, you know, what kind of 
what kind of conservation measures or or you know partnerships to what end right you know what what are these partnerships you can name names if you want to yeah yeah i'm not saying don't (laughs) (laughs) well um so a good example of that is uh let's just say farm bill work which uh as you all know is a large body of work um when you really dive into it and start advocating for policies that are positive for landowners across the u.s um, and, and when you look at something, let's just break it down to just the conservation title and not talk about all the other pieces and parts to the farm bill. Um, y- you know, we work with all types of groups in that, that type of an arena, um, from sportsmen's groups to conservation groups to uh, sustainable agriculture groups. Um, y- yeah, it's really kind of across the board who we work with um, on, on those types of large projects like the farm bill now that's on the policy side that's on the policy do you do any uh, do you have any on the ground projects that you would do partnerships on we do we do like say Um, the implementation of the policy some of the policies yeah yeah we do um we're starting to build that out a little bit more we are a fairly young organization yeah when did you you know, when did you get started? I think, well, that's and a really good question. Did I put you on question. the spot? Yeah, you yeah. did. <laughs> I, I want to say that um, it's been about five years that it, the organization has really been operational, if you will. Um, and, and so that may not be exactly correct. So Yeah, uh, we're going to hold you to that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Yeah. So, um, you know, we are starting to hire uh, state-level field organizers with the idea that they'll be able to um, do more of the implementation, more of the knowledge sharing, stewardship tours, um, and then also, you know, bring what they learn kind of up to the policy level uh, as well. So that's starting to happen more. Um, A lot of the -the on-the-ground piece um, has been more of providing the resources and um, providing knowledge to landowners. So, um, for example, in New Mexico, uh, they the organization put on a soils health. You'll love this, Nephi. A soils health road tour, um, and partnered Keep going. with partnered Keep going. with NRCS and uh, landowners and others to to do that. So, uh, it it really you know uh, we're we're not too picky in our, I I don't want to say we're not too picky in our partnerships, but um, because certainly, you know, there are partnerships that may not work, as you pointed out earlier, Dave, but um, I I think that a lot of entities out there are working towards improving the land, um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for partnerships. That's exciting. I mean, I know that, uh, you know, in my past life, I, you know, I got the opportunity to work uh, with Western Landowners Alliance uh, in, in a, I don't know if I'd call it a partnership, but a, I'd say a collaborative of sorts yeah. um, with a whole host of just really diverse people around the table mm-hmm. and found that you know the pragmatism that Western Landowners Alliance brought to the table was very refreshing. Uh, it always came from a place of um, you know, uh, understanding, you know, mm-hmm. understanding other people's positions, but understanding, also understanding the resource and coming at it with a... Uh, a lot of knowledge bring you know, bringing a lot to the table. So I found that you know, I've been impressed so far with what I've seen yeah. out of Western Landowners Alliance. Thank you. Present company included. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do you want to talk about on on the conservation side? I mean, I'm I'm you know I'm thinking about it from okay. We've talked a lot about what what landowners can do for the landscape and the the value of wildlife, but. Uh, I kind of want to talk because I know, I know that you have an an ag background. I mean, you grew mm-hmm. up on a on a ranch, right? I did. Um, yeah. I also know that you're a hunter. I am. Right. Yeah. Um, Not as uh, committed to it, I would say, as as you guys are, but I am a hunter, and I grew up hunting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That seems like committed to it. True. You know, there's, you're. All in has different levels in hunting. True. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say you're all in. We're all all in. You know, I, w- I would point out you're the only one here with camo. That's on. right. That I did that on purpose. To just. <laughs> oh yeah. I feel that is just a good because point. I could. <laughs> but that camo means something. It does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It does. 
Tell us about it. So my camo that I'm wearing today has the uh, Wyoming Women's Antelope Hunt logo on it, of which I uh, was a proud participant in for several years and um, now uh, volunteer for the for the hunt and also provide, um, you know, donations and such to the hunt um, it, because it's such a fantastic uh, experience and so, yes, I wear my Wyoming Women's Antelope Hunt camo proudly. All right. Well, expl- yeah. so you've teed it up, but you I really have ha- you really <laughs> Let's you really talk have about to, that hunt. You have to really <laughs> dive. Well, it. first of all, you need to dive in and talk more about, okay, what is this Women's how did, Antelope Hunt? How did you hunt? get involved in it? So tell us your story first. Like your first time, Women's Antelope Hunt, what happened? What got you there? What's well, your personal? Well, I want to, before she does that, It'd I want to. be more entertaining because <laughs> she's like, I didn't know about it. And then, then uh, I just, I, you know, I, that, fine, that, if that works, I just want to make sure that people know what this is. What about yeah. my vote? My, Mike's the tie-breaking vote. Mm-hmm. I say explain what it is and then Ex- how you got involved. Okay, I can do that. <sighs> that's Thanks, the, Mike. That's the lawyer. <laughs> the, lawyer <laughs> the voice away. of reason, thank you. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the IRAC. Yeah. Issue, rule, application, conclusion. <laughs> IRAC. Or analysis. Application, yeah. analysis, analysis, whatever. Yeah. It's I, But IRAC, for sure. Yeah. That's wonky stuff right there. It is, Yeah. Anyways, coming here from Nephi. But but every argument you m- that you make will make complete sense if you follow that procedure. How come it doesn't work for you? All right, so the <laughs> Wyoming so the, Women's yeah, Antelope yeah. Hunt. Yeah, so the Wyoming Women's Antelope Hunt is an all women's hunt. Um, it's put on by the Wyoming uh, Women's Foundation, which is a part of the Wyoming Community Foundation. And um, essentially, uh, it's a bunch of of ladies and and that. Um, go to uh, part of Wyoming and um, hunt for a couple of days. And it's an opportunity to, I know you guys have talked about this with Jana Waller. I did listen to that one. We did. Yeah, Um, we actually did talk because she participated in it. She was a special guest at one of the hunts I was at um, and actually, you know, spoke and was quite inspiring of course um so uh and she spoke to the hunters at the orientation so early on you know there's a lot of nervousness um there are a lot of first time hunters and there's uh several you know hunters who have been hunting longer they're youth hunters uh veteran hunters um you name it there are all all kinds of women there of all ages. Um, and it's really inspiring. And, and Jana did speak and uh, was, was quite inspiring. And so basically, um, women get together for a few days. And, uh, you know, we start off by an orientation, sighting in your rifles. Um, so you're making sure that you're, uh, you know, um, you know, again, <laughs> prepared to, to hunt and um, then there's also hunter safety offered if, if someone doesn't have hunter safety. Um, and then we're teamed with a mentor and a beginning hunter are teamed with a guide. And yeah, we spend a couple days hunting. And um, it's really a great opportunity for camaraderie. Um, I grew up hunting. I grew up hunting, of course, with my dad and my two brothers. Um, and it's really a different experience to hunt with women than it is to hunt with, you know. All right, now, now your I want, dad and your brother. <laughs> now that we know what it is. I want the Jessica story. Yeah, so, so, how did you get involved? And in? tell us the personal, like, what was your experience with the one shot? Um, I got involved with it because I, I met someone um, who was involved in it, and they said, "Hey, we have a spot on our team. You should uh, join us." Um, we just happened to be at a so your team. I mean, you're really just function. talking about a group, like a, a group, like your yeah. group that's going to go out together in the same. Is it a, comp- no, well, is it a competition? It's a competition, but it's a different kind of a competition. Okay. So um, the the teams are actually sponsors. So mm-hmm. sponsors can oh, develop okay. teams. Yeah, right, so if I've right. got the, the Your Mountain team, let's say. You could do a Your Mountain team. If our checkbook were significantly larger. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sh- Yeah, I don't know what the cost is for that, but you could look into it, I'm sure. Dave, <laughs> um, Mike, Mike, you're on it. Mike's on it. I'll okay. look into it. For sure, by the time your daughter's are old enough and your son is old enough, sons are old enough to be a guide Nephi, you know, you should, you could, you should look into having a team. That would be cool. So that we'll have to think that about actually, that. That actually, that actually would be cool. Yeah. My daughter will be, she's two years away, year and a half away. Yeah. We should start thinking about that. She's 2020. She'll be old enough to, really? to hunt. Animals. She'll be 12. Yeah, she'll be 12 in 2020. 
Maybe next yeah. year. Yeah. So we might have to do a, a 2020 sponsorship of, uh, of, of, of the Women's Antelope. Yeah. Uh, we'll that have would to think be about co- that. That would yeah. be really cool. That would be really cool. But let's learn more. It would more. be cool. Let's, you know, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. back yeah. to your story. <laughs> so anyway, um, so yeah, I met this person and they had a spot open and I went. Um, and, you know, thinking, well, you know, I've hunted before. No big deal. Um, this is great and all but yeah no big deal and then when I actually went on the hunt it was um amazing and um you know the the women's foundation does a really good job of finding guys that are really interested in conservation and stewardship um ethical hunting practices and they do a really good job of making sure that um they also respect the land that they're hunting on because it is largely private land in the part of the Wyoming that the hunt is held. Um, And so it's really kind of a neat experience from that perspective in that they're teaching hunters all of these really important pieces of hunting, um, ethical hunting, stewardship, conservation, um, respecting landowners, all of that. And then we also, you know, there's also all of this time built in um, to share your story and to, um, you know, basically spend time together. And um, there's also, of course, other fun activities like fly fishing. Uh, You can learn to process your own animal, which I know how to process my own animal, but I am incredibly slow at it um so that's kind of painful for folks but you know it's really a good (laughs) it's really you know kind of the whole experience from sighting in your rifle to processing your animal and um and it's really a lot of fun so and and i'm assuming you make some great friendships lasting friendships oh yeah through something like that without a doubt yeah yeah How, how many times have you done it i've hunted three times and then you've been a guide, or no? I've not no. been a guide. Just, just I remember I'm up, really slow at processing. I don't think anyone would have <laughs> the patience for me if I were a guide. Um, but I have volunteered, and and yeah, so. The, and, and yeah. I, so I think it's really cool, on obviously on a lot of levels. But we've talked about it on you know on several episodes how women are the fastest growing demographic yeah. of of hunters, right? And sometimes, and I think. I don't remember, I think we've had people tell us this, that sometimes uh, women can be uncomfortable going hunting with men, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced that or not, but you know, that's been some of the feedback on this, is that w- women can sometimes be uncomfortable hunting with men, and this is an opportunity uh, you know, to to really grow as hunters mm-hmm. and, you know, grow with other women uh, as hunters uh, and it, it just in a very comfortable environment from It is. Yeah, Yeah, it is. I mean, for me personally, I grew up hunting with men. And so I've never been uncomfortable hunting with men. Um, And then certainly in my college years, uh, my first experience turkey hunting was with a bunch of guys who said, you have got to try this. You know, you've never been bird hunting. So um, I'm certainly not uncomfortable with that. But I, I, I will, I, you know, I really will say it is a very different experience. Um, you know, when you have a bunch of women sitting around telling their hunting story, um, than you know, other experiences that I've had. So, uh, so I, I've got to know, uh, you know, pull the curtain back on this conversation a little bit for <laughs> us. Uh, you know, because when we have a hunting story, uh, or a fishing story, I mean, you know, the rumors, like I might catch a 14 inch trout, but when I'm telling Nephi about it, I was like a 21 inch, seven pound rainbow. Uh, same thing I think probably happens with uh, big game. I mean, I mean, I mean, what kind of stories are you telling here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say that when women tell their stories, they're much more, at least when they're in the company of uh, trusted friends, as is the case with the women's antelope hunt, um, there's probably a lot more truth to those <laughs> stories. <laughs> um, you know, a lot, a lot more talk about the miles that you walked, and not like, yeah, I walked so many miles and I'm awesome. It's more of a, I walked so many miles and it was tiring. You know, <laughs> so there's a little more truth to the story. Um, you know, certainly at times there's a little, a little bit more emotion. Um, but honestly, it brings a whole new, for me anyway, it kind of brought a whole new life to hunting um, because I enjoy hunting. I enjoy providing food for my family. My husband doesn't hunt, although he will go with me. Um, but, you know, so, so for me, it was kind of 
that community was really important and bringing that new life to hunting for me, you know, an activity that I'd been doing since childhood was really, it was really kind of fun. Um, and to be able to do that for three years was amazing. So um, what I'm hearing you say is you grew up hunting in New Mexico, right? I did, New Mexico and okay. Texas. And, yeah. and, and then in college, you hunted in Texas. I did, yeah. And it wasn't awesome and fun until you came to Wyoming and hunted. <laughs> Is that what I heard? Mm -hmm. That's not exactly. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty close, though. I think every hunting experience I've ever had has been pretty... I don't know. There's been something about it that sticks with me, certainly. Oh, okay. So yeah. You didn't say I, that. I, I, it's a po it doesn't have to be a positive to stick with you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got plenty of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is interesting. I have some from this season. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is interesting how everybody has their own unique hunting experiences and, and, and uh, how we all kind of, for lack of a better term, we end up in these little tribes that feel really comfortable to us. And there's just as a, as a, common on to that and i was talking with uh you know with kyle and scott and some other folks on other podcasts and it, and it and it is interesting that like we come together and like there's you know a group of five of us who really enjoy each other's company you know would go hunt elk and i would say i love hanging out with my good friends here dave and mike but i'm not necessarily in that hunting tribe you know, you guys have a different tribe that you guys go with when you guys go hunt elk than my tribe when I go hunt elk. And that doesn't mean that we wouldn't go hunt together. It just means like there's just a, there's just a, a you know, there's just a different group and, and you, and you, and you learn to like maybe hunt differently. I know I, I like to hunt open spaces in, you know, Western Wyoming, you know, you, Dave likes to hunt timber. Consequently, Mike loves to hunt, you know, tight timber with yeah. Dave. Where on the and I'll give everybody the. I'll, uh, but I'll go with you. I'll, I'll I, try. It I know, and I would go with you guys too. But, um, it is interesting that that happens, and I think that that's both a uh, it's something that's very positive, um, that we make these relationships and we build these little tribes, these these friendships. But it's also something to recognize, and it's another thing we talked about in another podcast: the importance of. Uh, of recognizing that there are people who view things maybe a little bit differently and maybe hunt differently or come from a different place, but that their experiences are just as valuable, just as important as, as mine are. And that, you know, protecting those rights and opportunities for them and, and, and creating those opportunities for them is just important as my opportunities. And whether you're a member of, uh, you know, Rocky Mountain Elk or some other organization, you know, whether you're a backcountry hunter or whether you are pheasants forever, you know, hunting on the ranch down there. Like we all, you know, we, we all have this shared commitment and this shared importance to, to keeping that heritage going. And, and let me tell you this, Nephi, I would gladly camp with you. And <laughs> Just not in your special hunting <laughs> spot? Hey, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is, you know the the company gone, that we hunt together. The, we've gone yeah, so, goose hunting. Yeah, and so I'd say the company that one keeps around the campfire, or you know at at the the hunting camp, you can have very different styles of hunting, and still all come together at the evening you know, at around the camp. campfire at yeah. base camp and have you know sh have a shared experience still. So you can go do your high mountain top. You know, glassing for 17 <laughs> miles, you know, at, at an elk and say, "I'm see that elk that bedded down 17 miles. I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch him in three days." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I can have I my, hope. <laughs> and I can have my, you know, walk through the timber and, and trip on and one, tri yeah, kick one off of its bed at four yards, you know, experience, and and, and we can share those experiences around the campfire. So my, I'm happy to go on a hunting trip with you, even if we walk opposite directions in the morning. You know what's funny is like, <laughs> and I feel the same way, but it is, uh, it's funny how like when you, if, you know, you've been a hunter mentor, right? And, I have. And I have too. And I say that hunter mentor, I mean, I've taken friends who were, you know, adult friends, like on their first hunts. And it, isn't it interesting how you kind of teach people to hunt like you hunt? And, you, and then when you choose, <laughs> when you choose, for me at least, I, I will say that I've done this many times and like, you'll start to weed out individuals. You'll be like, can't bring that guy again where you're like just because you're like that the style like the, like that's not gonna work with me like you know like the next year it's like dating yeah yeah <laughs> you're like <laughs> you just try and figure out are we are we really compatible are we hunting compatible yeah and oh you find gosh. that sometimes you're like are we wrong jessica I mean, it's, 
I mean, you got to have hunting compatibility. I don't know that I've ever had that thought before, <laughs> honestly. No? No. You, no, you've, I'm, you've I'm never, certain of it. You've never dated your hunting partner, figuratively speaking, uh, to see if it was going to work out? You know? No. I, I mean, I'm but not I saying... But I don't go with this... I don't go hunting with just... You know, the same Jessica's person scared year in commitment. and year out. She's scared of I'm, commitment. That must be it. I'm scared <laughs> of commitment. <laughs> or maybe it's the other way around. You're the people who go with me are uh, <laughs> you're, you're like part of the, shying away. So you're like part of the Tinder of hunting. Yeah. Right. It's like you're <laughs> constantly left. swiping. Yeah. Uh, is it left or right? Or I don't know. Whatever I mean, you're swiping. I don't uh, really don't know anything I, about I was Tinder. Working <laughs> I was working hard to try to figure out how to get that in there. <laughs> We we got it in for you. Yeah, the Timber app. That's funny. The Timber. Dave, Dave we'll make a new one. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> this is money in the bank. Timber instead of Tinder. We, <laughs> the hunting app. This can we can is this podcast is saying that right now? Is this good enough to be copyrighted? Your uh, attorneys. This sure, is our idea. This, this is, is our, our idea. idea. What's yeah. the date? Um, yeah. It's Timber. the 13th. Pat, patent pending. It's digital. Patent, patent, patent pending. pending. <laughs> <laughs> Don't uh, try and steal this. That's a that's Dave a, will sue you. No, I love it. I love it. That's a great like idea for a timber. for a bringing mentors together, it like is. a hunting mentor well, program. Yeah, and it's Swipe just right. as shallow, right? Because yeah. then you get a picture of a guy and you're like, I don't like his camo. Yeah, yeah. 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 No. <laughs> I'm, well, this guy's I'm, got the right I'm, camo. I'm a cryptech guy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's brilliant. I like I think it. we're on to something. Mossy Oak, come on. I like it too. I mean, Good I like. <laughs> Yeah, you do that, right? I actually kind of do. <laughs> I mean, I've been brilliant it seems to before. Fit your but style, particularly, it does, Justin. doesn't it? <laughs> you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> Let's drive separately, though, just in <laughs> just case. Just in case it doesn't work out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right. Well, where do we go from yeah. here? I don't know. We've kind of pinnacled there. I mean, well, that's. So, one other thing that I would say about the women's antelope hunt is my daughter is five. Mm-hmm. And um, so she kind of grew up. And adorable, up, by uh, the way. And a real, yeah, yeah. really opinionated, mm-hmm. sweet little girl. Oh, but she's adorable. Yeah. She Thank really you. Is. Yeah. You guys yeah. are nice. She is. She is adorable. No, she's Don't tell adorable. her that, though. Oh, we won't. Oh, man. So we'll, we'll give her self esteem issues when we see her. But, <laughs> right, but behind okay. her back, <laughs> she's adorable. She's adorable. <laughs> Oh, this girl. So anyway, <laughs> she grew up, you know, going to the antelope hunt. And um, what I love about that is that, you know, she's comfortable with understanding where food comes from. Um, you know, she understands that, it, and she calls it the antelope party. So she, she understood <laughs> from an early age, you know, what was happening at the antelope party. And, you know, understanding where food comes from. And I love that because I think that's really important because I, I grew up on a ranch and I grew up hunting. And I, you know, now I attempt to grow a garden in Wyoming. And, and so for um, me, you know, it's really kind of... Harder than hunting. It, Way no harder kidding. Than hunting. <laughs> Way harder than hunting. No kidding. So I think We would that all starve to death. Yeah. If I we can grow lettuce really of well, but you can't kale. survive off yeah. lettuce. <laughs> yeah, nothing but kale. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's just kind of a side benefit, um, you know, just, you know, and I talk about it in the context of my daughter because, you know, it's so noticeable in her because she's young. But really, I think for everyone there, you know, it's uh, and there certainly are people there who had never had that experience where they you know, really knew where their food was coming from in that way. And that's, that's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting conversation to have with someone when, when you realize, you you know, you've never had the scenario where you really, I mean. (laughs) It becomes visceral. Exactly. It's a different conversation. It is. It is. I think that's really cool that you do that with your daughter. Um, My daughter has, so I process all my own stuff too. My daughter works the, the meat grinder now. Nice. I mean. She's yeah. she is way into that. Yeah. So I, th- I I was I was thinking as you were talking about that, um, and you were saying that you're that you're pretty terrible. Uh, I'm terrible. I'm oh, putting yeah. words in your mouth. But it you, you the speed at which you process isn't you know it could be improved upon. It could um, definitely be Im- anything that. Um, call my daughter over. Have her help you. I probably <laughs> should. It, anything that has <laughs> she's, like she's sharp like, edges. <laughs> It's like a little ninja. Um, <laughs> is she really? Oh, she's pretty solid. Yeah. She probably should come help me. <laughs> she's, I mean, Mike's seen it, right? You've been out there in the garage. She's probably some child labor. Yeah, being yeah broken, we were out there. I mean, I didn't see her operating a knife, but but she was helping out on the grinding and all that. And she was right in it. Still has all her yeah. fingers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she does all the grinding and packaging all the burger That's and everything. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And, and not just like catching 
um, you know, the ground meat. It, she's like sticking it in, and, and <laughs> you know, I'm a little grew, scared. So yeah. that's yeah, awesome. She's pretty good. So yeah. let me ask you guys this: How old were your kids when you first took them hunting? Because um, I'm going to take Adlin hunt turkey hunting. Eight. Took my son this year. Wait, wait. wait took wait, them wait, along, well. along, or? not hunting. She w- she wants to go yeah. sit with me while so I Nephi hunt. is saying I took him hunting, he, like he had him a, hunting he had this year. My a, oldest, a, I've a got fire. an eight year old and a yeah. five year old. Yep. Okay. And Wyoming, yeah. we have a law that we passed that allows you to mentor um, for small game and upland birds. It it's the as long as they're with the parent, they they're um, they can carry a weapon. And they can, uh, and they're, and they count against your bag limit. Right. And so that's important. So you have to have hunter safety. They have to be directly like there with you. It's not like you can send them off, but as long as you're with them. So we, I took him, you know, hunting rabbits. And what this looks like for me is my eight year old's carrying around one of those little savage, like a little, you know, a snake charmer. Yeah. A little <laughs> single shot, little single shot yeah. bolt action rifle. And then I have got a single 22 long rifle shell in my pocket and he gets to pack that rifle around and then you can talk you know and 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 he, we've been going to the range since for a long long time but it just reinforces those things about you know um safety issues so you can make sure that he you know he's he's practicing proper muzzle control mm-hmm. he isn't putting his hands where they shouldn't be in terms of you know fingers always out of the trigger guns always on safe and you can work through them through all that stuff so that hopefully someday when he's old enough, you know, it's not when he goes on his first bigger hunting experience, this, it won't feel new to him. It won't be quite as intimidating. So, mm. yeah. So nice. the first time I took my daughter along was, um, was three years ago. On the, uh, on the cow elk hunt yeah. that we did. Yeah. Yeah. And I took my daughter. That wasn't, so that would have been my daughter's first elk hunt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we did that three years ago. In mm-hmm. fact, okay, so, we got it. So they're they're both the same age. Yeah. So they were seven. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, but it, in in that and so that was probably late for me. But Dave's in a, a different boat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I want to come back. We got to tell a little story because oh, you probably it. remember this story I too. Um, <laughs> but you should tell it. But yeah. and I think we should. But but I I uh, I took my so my oldest took her for the first time when she was three. Mm-hmm. Uh, on on a dove hunt, took her along oh, for yeah. the first time when she was yeah. three. I took my youngest daughter along for the first time. She would have been one and a half, something. I had her in a backpack. Yeah. Uh, I took her on an archery moose hunt. <laughs> 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 I laugh a li- only a little bit because I took Griffin the first time. I took Griffin on was actually he was five, and it was an archery elk hunt and is the same thing i actually had him i remember that i told you where to go yeah i had him strapped i had yeah. him like strapped onto the back of my backpack and i was like i, I just start we're going for a hike right i just want to get him like hey we hunt together like nothing you know, you're not going to see any elk right we're not going to see any elk right dave sends me this spot sure enough we get into and elk. then how do you pack it out <laughs> when so, you're a kid? <laughs> well, so, so we're high, so so like I'm, he's like on my back and he's like dad there you know and he's like tell like he's like coaching me and then i was like Oh no, I'm going to get a shot at one, you know, <laughs> archery elk. I'm like, Oh no. Oh no. And so it ended up getting, it ended up like we actually got within 20 yards of a cow. And so then what are you supposed to do? You're 20 yards away. So I was like, all right, you know, draw back and then, uh, let one fly and hit, hit, a. Uh, you know, hit like, you know, the scenario, like the one branch between you and the elk and skipped that arrow you know, right, you know, a foot over the top of her. And I was so pumped and he was so mad at me. <laughs> he was just ticked. My dad's no good. Oh, man. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hear the end of that for months. He was just so, just couldn't, just disgusted that I would have blown that shot. See, our, our, cow, hunt, our cow hunt ended a little differently than that, than yours. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we actually, I don't know, the herd was probably 30. Yeah, that's about right. 30 yeah. elk, you know, mostly cows. Um, and we got ourselves in position, you know, saw them on the move, got in front of them, cut them off, were able to get a shot with our girls right there. Um, we killed, each of us killed a cow elk and you know, probably 50 yards apart. 
you know, they yeah. dropped about 50 yards from each other. Yeah. And so we started quartering them up, and our our daughters were running back and forth between these elk, help you know, helping out where they could, holding a leg where they could, whatever. Um, but it was that's not the cool part of the story. This, this, I mean, it, obviously, it was an awesome moment for to have our daughters with us yeah. there. Uh, but this this hunt took a weird turn, uh, <laughs> a weird turn after that, uh, because, uh, and I think we can say this now, where we all worked back then, right? Because uh, it's, I think, kind of relevant to this story. None of us work there now. None uh, of us work true. there now. Um, yeah, I do. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, true. fair enough. But it's okay. It's okay. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, so we kill these elk, and it's it's after dark. You know, well after dark. By the time we get them, you know, quartered up and Which, loaded. Fortunately, in my truck. we had uh, <laughs> truck lights. <laughs> I know the story. Yeah, yeah. So, so we so we get them. We get these. Well, uh, okay. Huh? Well, but we were all. So I was. Are, we, are you going to skip over the part where where it gets weird with the kids? Or are you talking about no, no, the next I'm day? No, no, I'm talking about garage. the next day. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because so, yeah, yeah. So, there was a couple of points where the kids, seeing things for the first time, were, were like, well, can I can I touch it? Can I right. when poke are you, it with a stick? When are you going to cut off its head? Can I poke its uh, eye with a stick? Yeah. Why is it pooping if it's dead? Yeah, there, there were a lot of questions. Which, which the whole pooping incident did come back in a, uh, like a one of those... Uh, pegboard or whatever displays in second grade that's for both of our kids that's right they had to give They're a like, presentation yeah like, a, like oh my who, who are you and what are you about and all that and both girls <laughs> unbeknownst <laughs> to the other put pictures in from the hunt and they talk about it and i think one of the one of the girls said that something about the the best part was when it pooped. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the best it part was just, of that is when it pooped. Yeah, it was it's like the, the most amazing. It's the best anatomy lesson. Yeah. So you do have so, to tell the rest of the story. Yeah, so, and, so, and, yeah. and the context is important. So at the time, a number of us were working as policy advisors for the governor of Wyoming. Right. And so this was hilarious for me because I'm sitting in my my office on the second floor of this building, like with looking out the window, huh, mama, okay. having a good day. And okay, you roll don't get, in. Yeah, so don't yeah, get too yeah. far like, ahead of it. Don't hey, get Dave, too far ahead of it. How you doing, man? How was your elk hunt? Yeah. And so we, and it was great. Oh, right? we said suits it was great. and ties and everything, and everybody yeah. up there, like, <laughs> I mean, just as, as, you know, imagine as bureaucratically, like, you got to, this is the highest levels of, of political bureaucracy. So imagine that, you know, this yeah. is the office you're walking into. Right. So, so this is what happened. We, we, we killed these elk, and I should, should be clear, it's the middle of August. It's an early season. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cow yeah. elk hunt. It was like uh, day two season. Oh, wow. Middle of August. Yeah. Early, early. Yeah. 80 degrees out, you know, the, that day. Or it was actually kind of cool that day. The next day, the scheduled temperature was supposed to be 80 degrees. Yeah. The day, we, that, the day that we had meat in the back of the truck. Right. So we had these all loaded up in my truck and I had a topper on the truck, but we weren't going to be able to deal with the meat that night. And we weren't going to be able to deal with the meat the next morning. It was going to be later in the day before we could deal with it. So we went to a, a convenience store and we bought, I don't know, 20 bags of ice, something like that, uh, and packed Packed the all these of the quarters. Truck the back of the truck became packed a with cooler. Ice, became yeah. a cooler because we didn't have. They were bone bone in quartered, <laughs> uh, and and we just needed to pack them in ice, yeah. get that meat cooled down, and recognizing it was going to be hot the next day. Right. The next morning, got up and got another ten or fifteen bags of ice and packed it in. So I drive to work that morning, yeah. uh-huh. and uh, well, yeah, because because you had an eight o'clock. Right, I had an eight o'clock meeting. And I, right, so <laughs> and I'm to, hanging out in the office. So I had to suit yeah. up for that. And yeah. you had a meeting after right after that. that. Right, yeah, with, immediately with, following with it with the same individual. Yeah, that you had to be there and an important individual. An important individual. So, so yeah, right. you just go we right can just to work. Say it. And, I mean, who the, the governor of the state <laughs> of Wyoming? <laughs> yeah. The guy who sounds our paycheck. Appropriately. You had to be dressed yeah. appropriately. <laughs> you couldn't just cancel this meeting, right? Yeah. No. So, so we go into the. Your, the parking garage, right? right? So I go yeah. to the par- so I and, go in the parking garage because remember, it's covered. When you in these parking garages, like well, first there all, are certain spots where you park, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And I park, right. it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but I didn't this time. <laughs> that, that, that's the thing. I didn't this time. So we had assigned, you know, we had reserved parking for our office, um, but I didn't park there. I wanted to park on the in, in the interior of the parking garage where it wouldn't get any sun, direct sunlight at all, uh, because it was supposed to get so hot. And so I drove, it's a multi-floor, so I drove up to the top of the ramp um, <laughs> to, the, to the first floor, and I just pulled right into that spot, right at the top right of, at the the top main, of the ramp. main ramp. Well, so no. go into the meeting, right? And, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, 
my the way my wife tells the story. Oh, no, uh, no, 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 no. You, yeah, you did your meeting, uh, then then I did my meeting, and and then you had a follow on meeting after that. And I gave you the keys to my truck. You, yeah, you gave me the keys to your truck because it was like eleven thirty by the time I could get done with the meeting, and literally it was like. Thanks, Gub. Ran out, got in the truck, <laughs> and, and then I had to drive the next town over, which is like forty minutes away. Yeah, to take it to, to the, the process. This was th- these we had to have processed because there was just so much going on. We did, we couldn't. Yeah, just no yeah, time. Meetings, Normally yeah. I process it myself, but we just couldn't deal with these. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I'm I'm in Laramie, in or, the or on the way to Laramie, and I get the call from you, which was preceded by a call from your wife. Right. So. <laughs> As the story goes, a maintenance person had been walking through the parking garage <laughs> and had seen uh, a blood trail <laughs> running down the ramp 30, 40, 50 feet down the ramp out of the back of this so truck. 20, pound, 20 bags of ice will melt in 80 degrees, even in the shade. With... And, and it will with, combine with and the blood. And you're parked at the top of, two, of the ramp. Uh, and I'm top, parked at the top of the ramp. So the only place I can up. go is right down <laughs> the ramp. But that, but that wasn't their first concern. Oh, it was because they had to clean no, it they, up. No, but, but, but they followed that. And I have a topper. I told you I had a topper. Mm-hmm. They followed that blood trail up. <laughs> and they looked in the back. And all they saw were just legs everywhere. Just <laughs> and, yeah, and eight, so they're, eight legs. Eight legs. So their <laughs> thought. But this is the beautiful part. Their thought. and the, So they called... Uh, because it's order. Wyoming and they're maintenance workers and they're smart enough to know, boy, it's mid-August. That seems a little early uh, for hunting right? season. Right. And so they right. call up the game warden and what they say to the game warden is, somebody here killed a bunch of antelope. Well, there were no antelope seasons. They, you know, they pulled the license plate. They got my name. They saw I didn't have an antelope tag. Uh, I don't even think there was an antelope season open in that area at the time. And so... Then the hunt was on. Yeah. And they Dave's showed in the Dave's <laughs> right. with the governor. I do remember this now. <laughs> and, and he's sitting there with the governor and, and like the entire game and fish <laughs> department is like gonna bust whoever this is. They yeah. show up at my house, my <laughs> wife's home, they ring the doorbell and explain the situation. They say, Did your did your husband get a cup uh, go antelope hunting, get a couple antelopes? I said, No. But they they got a, they got some elk, uh, you know, and, and and like the hair on his neck went up. And this was a game warden trainee at the time. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's oh, right. this is a huge case for me. I just broke this big case, and and uh, it's like this. She, and your guy, like some of your friends, though, game and fish, they're like, ha 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 ha. They like they know everything that's oh, going they, on. Oh, they absolutely know what's going on. And you know, they so they egg this warden on, and he's he's tracking me down, and he he comes to the office then to try and find me, and as it turns out, I'd left, and uh, you left. And, and, yeah, because I was on the road with, with the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, I got a phone call from him, and I explained the situation, and then he, he rolls into the governor's <laughs> office looking for the poacher. So I just remember, I just remember talking to the governor after this whole ordeal, you know. And obviously, everything was on the up and up. And I do feel uh, a, a bit guilty that I didn't park uphill, so the. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so, so the you know, yeah, or next to a drain, or next yeah. to a drain, or just something, yeah. so this wouldn't happen. But you know, and and I know in some ways, you know, people might listen to this and think that's a little grotesque. There's this blood trail running down the parking garage, uh, but I remember telling the governor this story, <laughs> and and I I just said, uh, you know, and, and he he he's a great guy, and he he tr- he thought it was he just actually thought it was kind of funny. But I my comment <laughs> to him was, just please, I don't want an executive order I don't, that bans <laughs> animal parts in the parking garage. What kind of a state needs that executive <laughs> order anyway? I said I'll do better next time. I won't. I won't do this next time. Oh um, man! I just thought that was a it, it was a unique experience. It all started with taking our daughters out. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, on, a, on an elk hunt. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> Jessica, funny. you would have been there and seen that. You would have remembered that story. I do too. remember that. Yeah. Uh, they made for an entertaining staff meeting <laughs> the next day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, and that recirculated several times. It did, but, yeah. But the moral of the story is, I mean, we were doing the right thing, right? We were protecting that meat, pro- well, you know, keeping we, it cool. Is we, that the moral we, of the story? Well, <laughs> we also... There are other morals, probably. <laughs> we also have acquired large um, coolers. coolers. <laughs> Since right. Then. And some other things that we didn't have... You know, three yeah, years at ago. At that point, yeah. So now we, 
we bone everything out and we keep it well, in yeah, coolers yeah. and bagged nice. But this was just a situation yeah. where we were just trying to get things out of the field and back to town. We got back to town at midnight or something and had to oh yeah you know, with it our was, the girls daughters were, and they had to go to school the next day. Oh yeah, we had to get to work. So it was yeah. you know it was a big yeah it was beginning of school. It was year brutal. Too, so we were just kind of managing it the best way we could. They were they were out like lights. They did not wake up. Yeah. And and we had a little Maybe trouble navigating have... back to the road. Um, yeah, well, we're not supposed to talk about yeah, that. Well, part. Yeah, but I mean, it was <laughs> it was a little. But is that when you? Uh, there was a lot of boulders that you had to kind of. Oh yeah. To is this some? Is this around. a secret still? Uh, that we got ourselves a little turned around out there. No, no, no. Wasn't there a little? Wasn't there a little? No, no, that didn't happen your... on that trip. Oh, okay. I don't know when that happened. You're talking, yeah, no, yeah, We're not, no that'll the, be another day. The, the <laughs> issue on, on this trip was not. That never happened. <laughs> was not that, we didn't really necessarily get turned around as much as you had to serpentine your way back to get to the elk to avoid various boulders. And when you're doing the serpentining, you're going one direction and it's daylight. And then you turn around and you're going the opposite direction. So you have to back out, you have to go out the, the back way. And there's there's no yeah, this, markers you can't see, yeah. and so it was disorienting. And we should, but, yeah. but we, I mean, we, we made it back. It just was. It just I just remember taking a little bit, and and the girls were fortunately asleep because otherwise they might have panicked or something. Uh, and and <laughs> you know, it, I think it's we should probably point out. Yeah, we were, um, so we were on a ranch. Yeah, uh, yeah. and we had permission from the landowner to for purposes of retrieving the animal to go off the two track to retrieve the animal uh, i would never advocate for doing that um, but we did have permission for retrieval purposes to do that and that kind of circles back around to the stewardship stuff that you're talking sure about yeah. earlier right yeah don't um you know that's not something that you should that i would advocate doing you know every yeah. day of the week but well and on a lot of public lands you can't right you can only one of my so far, yeah. other favorite stories. I don't know if you've told this one about the game warden and the and the, the keys to the four wheeler. We told that on this podcast. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell that another time. Oh yeah. man, Let's that's such that a good that's story. Great, that's a We're great story. We're gonna forget it. No, it'll come up at it's some point. It's a teaser. It's a teaser. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jessica, anything else that that you want to add about Western circling all the way back around about Western Landowners Alliance that. that we didn't have an opportunity to touch on. No, I, I think we've touched on a lot of it, actually. So I, I know um, we got sidetracked there. We, we have, that's okay. I expected <laughs> we'd get sidetracked a few times. So yeah, no yeah. big deal. <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, you know, kind of in closing, as it relates to the Western Landowners Alliance, you know, just, uh, you know, putting it out there to your listeners that uh, you know, the stewardship aspect and, and um you know, I, I know that you guys have an interest in, and you're, you often talk about uh, the access and hunting and fishing and such. And the stewardship ac- or, uh, the stewardship side of that conversation is um, incredibly important. And, and you know, just uh, a recognition maybe that landowners, you know, provide that opportunity and they provide, you know, so many of the benefits that we enjoy, even if you, you know, aren't on their land, particularly as you talked about in your story, um, you know, they are providing habitat for wildlife and clean air, clean water, open spaces, all of those things that, you know, we all enjoy and it's why we live in the West. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I just circle, circle back with kind of that idea of, of stewardship and just taking care of the land. I think that's a, that's a great message to end on, right? Um, you, I hope you'll join us again at some point. Uh, yeah, I I have a feeling maybe I have a, I <laughs> you have might a, have to talk me into it or tempt uh, me with more hot I, tea. I, I think <laughs> I have a feeling you have some uh, some good stories that you need to share with us. Uh, I don't know. I <laughs> Are you doing the antelope hunt again this year? You're gonna do the women's antelope hunt. Uh, so I um, gave my spot up on the team so that someone else could go um, because I got to do it three times. Paying it forward. Huh? And yeah, I I mean I think that part of it is giving someone else the opportunity who's never had the opportunity before. So um, I don't know, maybe someday I'll actually participate in the hunt again, but for now I'm content. Well, I was just going to say helping. we should try and make it up there for that. That'd be cool. I think that'd be really neat. I, I'd love to take my kids up there to just to experience. See, yeah, just be part of it. Cause I mean, that's yeah. one of, the, I mean, that's one of the neat things about an event like this is that yeah. it just, you know, there's, there's a, you know, charity auction and right. If nothing else you can, yeah, go to the auction and yeah. Well, ma- and maybe it'd be a good place to promote that new timber app. The timber <laughs> app. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. Sure. 
Uh, if you're an app developer, <laughs> developer and you're listening to this, call me. Yeah. No, call Dave. Yeah, yeah. call Dave. <laughs> or just send us an email to your mountain at it's your mountain dot com and get a, get a hold of us. You'll also get a, f- a federal <laughs> premium ammunition belt buckle. <laughs> um, That's funny. So before we go, you've listened to this a few I times, have. right? You know what's coming, don't I do. you? So what? what this is, is it? the part that makes me so nervous. I don't know. Really? What is it? What? What? what you don't know why you're, you're you don't so know nervous? You're nervous? No, or? I don't know the answer to your you question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think you do it. All right. All what, right. Ask it. What's your mountain? What is it? So, I mean, I I grew up on a ranch, and that's where I went, you know, on my first hunt. And I think, uh, of course, that would be, you know, it's in central New Mexico. That would be one of them because, you know, those childhood memories, they're always the best. Um, But really, uh, you know, if I really think about it, it's any Texas Hill Country River that I can just stroll down with my fly rod trying to catch bass. There is nothing like it. Um, uh, why have none of us received an invitation to said rivers? Well, because you have to go to Texas. I'm willing to do You're that. You're willing to? Yeah. It's the, it is I need probably, to uh, for me anyway, uh, I love to fish. Um, I learned how to fly fish in Oregon. Um, I am a terrible, f- you guys know this, you've seen me, I am not good at it. But when you can walk down the m- middle of a w- river and it's warm, um, which I think is a benefit, um, and you can just take your fly rod and just hit the spots where the bass are sleeping, oh, it is fantastic. And the Texas Hill Country is beautiful. And uh, yeah, you, can you are the first person to come on here and talk about fly fishing for bass. I, uh, I as your mountain, that, I think that's yeah. a great that's a great different perspective. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It it absolutely is. We and should I go w- sometime. I would like to see your mountain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, thanks again. Yeah, thank you guys. You know, really it was appreciate fun. you being here. Yeah. Uh, anything else from you guys? No, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm awesome. You don't want to get one more one more sentence in with that sultry voice you got. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, hey, thanks for listening, everybody. And remember, life is about experiences, so go have one. <laughs>